Oh, it's quite a pass. Okay. <laughs> I might have to quickly run Christoph through what he's missed. Uh, on what, what? What did? Sorry, I didn't get it. I'm going to quickly run you through what you missed. Ah, okay. Which is yeah, going to be good okay. for the students anyway, because it's, yes. this is yes. a, a deep proof, right? Yes. Very quick summary of the previous lecture. We were dealing with the Hilbert transform on the torus now, which is bounded once you know that it's bounded on the real line on LP. That'll be the next. Um, we also deal with the n torus. We have trigonometric polynomials. We've got all of this language. That's all pretty standard. This is the Hilbert transform as a Fourier multiplier. That's the fact that it's bounded on LP once you know that the Hilbert, it's a transference result, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you also know that the once it's bounded with respect to X, you know that it's bounded with respect to LP of X by a Fabini argument, which we didn't do. Uh, we have this language of the nth copy of the torus in the capital N torus, T sub N, because we look at functions of the nth variable or functions in the first N variables. We have the Hilbert transform acting on the nth in the nth variable. And we have this fundamental proposition that we proved. When you have a sequence of functions that are mean zero in the nth variable valued in the first N minus one variables, so n variable functions with mean zero in the nth variable. Then you have this sort of unconditionality of the Hilbert transforms in the nth variables. And from that, you can prove the UMD property by representing all dyadic martingales in terms of Rademacher functions. So every dyadic martingale difference sequence actually has this form for some function of the first n minus one Rademacher variables. Then you take a different Rademacher sequence on the n torus, such that the nth Rademacher variable is in the nth variable of the n torus. Write it out as an estimate for functions on the n torus, so that you're reduced down to this functions that are being zero in the nth variable, as in the fundamental proposition. And then you use the, the square of the Hilbert transforms minus the identity. <laughs> to put in uh, two Hilbert transforms here and then use the fundamental proposition twice. Okay, so you yep. very crucially go through the n-dimensional torus somehow. Yep. It's like that's very important. It's, so that's what I didn't, really, yeah, it's a bit, that's right. This may be a bit surprising if, if you get yeah. this idea. <laughs> the key idea there is like, when you're thinking of the dyadic filtration and dyadic martingales, if you have a, when you're like n levels deep in the filtration, you can actually think of having n independent variables that are parameterizing the thing. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. the idea there. Right. So, so each, on the -torus. each of the dimensions counts for a scale or for a single Haar coefficient? For, for a scale, exactly. For scale, yeah. For the, the nth Rademacher function. Yes, 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 yep. yes, yes. There's no actual Haar coefficients here. It's purely Rademacher decompositions now. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yep. yeah. You don't do different things in spatial locations. It's just scale. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yep. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I missed that. That's, uh, yeah, I didn't actually know that uh, part of the argument. Yeah, uh, it's in my notes. And <laughs> I'll look also, it up. I, I already told everybody else, but the, the thing that you were uh, unsure about on Tuesday was actually wrong. You, you were right to be unsure about it. Uh -huh. The thing is, okay. my group was wrong. The way I constructed the filtration was wrong. Yes, you need to actually but, but, construct the filtration smarter to get that conditional expectation yes. identity. But in terms of notation, you were only an epsilon away from the two size. It was, it was close, yeah. <laughs> it needs some, <laughs> some extra thought. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The basic idea is still correct. Okay, good. Yep. Yeah. And you were right that the thing that was missing from my argument was measurability. That it uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If yeah, you yeah, look at my yeah. notes, I've pointed out where the mistake is, but I haven't yes, fixed yes, it yet in the notes yes, because yes, I was yes, too busy yeah, writing yeah, next week's notes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Often I feel better when I have a complaint and sometimes I have an idea how to solve the complaint. <laughs> you can, in this case, I wasn't quite sure. Yeah. <laughs> I just couldn't quite get it, but yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. It sounded like could be close. Right? Good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So the next, this hour, well, this 45 minutes is about proving the fundamental proposition, mm -hmm. which as I said, in the first hour, we proved by reducing it to a fundamental lemma, which I haven't stated yet. Here's the fundamental lemma. Which is the, the real genius of Borgan's argument. X is a complex Banach space. 
uh, p's between 1 and infinity. 1 can be allowed here, but it doesn't matter. Fix a sequence uh, m of non-zero integers. They can be positive or negative. That's important. But they're non-zero. And we define a map. You could call it the Borgan map. That's why it's denoted B. B sub M. It maps functions on the N torus. Sorry, capital N torus. Into functions on the one torus valued in the capital N torus. So it's adding an extra variable, basically. We define it like this. If you've got a function G, on the capital N torus, and you have your variable S in the one torus. This is a function of N of capital N variables, so we need to specify what's happening to the N, sorry, capital N. I said I'd say capital N, but I can't bring myself to do it. The capital N variables on the capital N torus. And we define this by taking the function G and I'll write it out and then I'll draw a picture. Like so, it's a change of variables. And if you draw the two torus, which is the only one you can easily draw, you draw a flat two torus, you know, you identify the edges as you do, that's a, a two torus. And then what's happening is at your point T, so T1 up to T capital N, you've got this direction M, which is determined by the sequence of non-negative integers. And as S varies, you basically wrap around the torus in that direction. Uh, what's happening here? There. And yeah, you wrap around part of the torus and you see this is now a function of one variable. I hope my picture's correct. That's the idea. It doesn't really help you understand the thing, but that's, that's the idea. That's the, the Borgan map, depending on the sequence M. This map has the following properties. Uh, the first one is not very miraculous, but it's useful. The Borgan map is an isometry. Not an isometric isomorphism, just an isometry. Preserves the norms. And it maps trigonometric polynomials to trigonometric polynomials. Not the same one, but you know, it maps trigonometric polynomials to other trigonometric polynomials. That's no real miracle. The miraculous property is this one. Given a sequence of trigonometric polynomials, f sub n, as before, their mean zero in the nth variable valued in the other n minus one variables. Given such a sequence of trigonometric polynomials, if the sequence of absolute values m sub 1, m sub 2, up to m sub n. If the sequence grows fast enough, and this fast enough depends on fn, actually we only need up to small n. If the sequence of absolute values of the sequence grows fast enough, depending on the functions you take, uh, then the Hilbert transform on the torus of the Borgan map applied to Fn. This is the, um, I'll write a tilde here because as I said before, this is the LPTNX valued Hilbert transform. So this, this is the confusing part. This Borgan map here gives you a function of one variable valued in a Banach space. And we apply the Hilbert transform in that one variable valued in that Barnard space. The Hilbert transform of this Borgan map is actually the sine of the nth term times the Borgan map applied to the Hilbert transform in the nth coordinate of Fn. This is the miracle. What this Borgan map does is it intertwines the Hilbert transform in the nth variable with a one-dimensional Hilbert transform in the new variable. 
the new variable s that you introduce. And there's a coefficient in this intertwining. And that coefficient is the sign of the nth term of the sequence. And that coefficient is extremely important. And this only happens if the sequence of coefficients grows fast enough in absolute, in absolute value. So what this map that's sort of wrapping around the torus is actually doing is it's letting you take the Hilbert transform in one of the, one of the directions, one of the coefficients, and it's letting you see it as the Hilbert transform in that direction M that you're pointing in. Up to a sign, and the sign's very important. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's a miracle. Let's prove it. There are probably very good underlying reasons that this happened. It's probably not such a miracle. I mean, it's just the, the truth of the universe, right? If you call that a miracle or whatever, there's no miracles in, in that sense, but it's surprising and very deep. So the fact that this map sends trigonometric polynomials to trigonometric polynomials, that's an exercise. It's not so interesting, so I call it an exercise. So you have to do it rather than me. The fact that it's an isometry is actually a straightforward calculation. So you take the Borgan map applied to some function G, measure its norm in the target space, take the peak power just to make the integrals a bit cleaner. It's an integral over T, the torus, an integral over the capital N torus of this function with the variables changed. Peak power, of course, everything is in X dt1 up to dt capital N ds. And what you do is you use the translation invariance of the measure on the torus in each individual coordinate, just one at a time. Or you can use translation invariance on the n torus, if you want to think of that, capital N torus. So just to write that out explicitly, your first step, if you want to do it in each coordinate separately, you change the variable of t1, replace t1 with t1 plus m1s, and you just get a new t1 t2 plus m2s. Hang on, these are not pluses, these are commas. That's better. So you can just use trans translation invariance in each coordinate individually. That's just the first one. You eventually do them all. Get t1 up to tn dt1, dtn, capital N, ds. But now there's no S dependence anymore. So once your S dependence vanishes, you get the LP norm of G as a function on the capital N torus to the peak power. So that's the isometric property of this map. The fact that it's linear is just, it's a change of variables. Every change of variables gives you a linear map on functions. That's quite standard. So this map is an isometry for every choice of sequence M. Sequence M doesn't matter at all. It's this intertwining property with the Hilbert transform that, that the work comes in, but that's also just a, basically a computation. So <coughs> consider a trigonometric polynomial F sub N, which is mean zero in the nth coordinate valued in the other n minus one coordinates. And let's write it out explicitly as a trigonometric polynomial with Fourier coefficients and exponentials. F sub n of t is the sum of frequencies m in the integers z to the n, such that the nth coordinate is non-zero. You can exclude those frequencies because any of those frequencies vanishes because of the mean zero assumption in the nth coordinate. So let's just say f is an LP zero of Tn. That's what lets you impose that condition. So you have the complex exponential E sub m and the Fourier coefficient, uh, yeah, the mth Fourier coefficient of f sub n. This is just the 
the Fourier representation. It's a trigonometric polynomial. It's a finite sum, no convergence issues. And we can separate out one of the variables, the, the nth variable that really matters. Write it as e, the vector m1 up to m n minus 1 of the variables t1 up to tn minus 1 times the complex exponential in the nth direction, the nth variable, times the Fourier coefficient. And so if you act on this function with the Hilbert transform in the nth variable, all it's going to see is, is this part here. That's all that really matters. All of the nth variable dependencies in this trigonometric polynomial here, this Fourier co uh, this complex exponential. So what you get is minus i sum over these integers sine of m sub n times the complex exponential that you started with times the Fourier coefficients. So that's what the Hilbert transform in the nth variable does to such a function. It, it pulls out the sine of m sub n. And therefore, when you apply the Borgan map to that, uh, now we have two variables, s and t, where t is, t is n variables. You get a sine of m sub n, nothing changes there. But t gets changed to t1 plus m1s up to t n plus m n s. We only have the first n variables like that. So this is our first computation here. We wanted to, to show that, remember, this is what we're trying to show, this intertwining property here. And what we've computed is that part. The, the Borgan map applied to a Hilbert transform. What we need to do now is compute the Hilbert transform applied to a Borgan map. So the next computation is what happens when we take the Borgan map and apply that to F sub n. We have two variables, s and t. Just by definition, this is t1 plus m1s up to tn plus mns. And then we write out the Fourier representation of f from before. We can write that as complex exponential e sub m of t times complex exponential e sub m dot capital M. Oh, and now we have n's capital n's m's capital shit. Okay. Uh, lost my train of thought there now. That complex exponential of s. So we can separate out what T and S are doing. Translations on the spatial side become modulations on the Fourier side, right? Times the Fourier coefficients. And you see that we're gonna take the Hilbert transform in the S variable. That's what we're gonna to need to do. And this is where all the S dependence is. So when we take this Hilbert transform in the S variable, You get minus i sum over all the stuff. And you get the sine of m dot m, m dot capital M, times the relevant complex exponential. Times the Fourier coefficient. Okay, so we have these two formulas here, the one from before and the one we just proved. And we compare them and we see that we almost have the same formula. We're showing that these two things are actually equal up to a coefficient. So I've got minus i, I've got the sum. These complex exponentials are the same here. These coefficients are the same. The only difference is in the sign term that appears in both of these formulae. And what we want to show, if you remember, is that 
the Borgan map applied to the Hilbert transform times the sine of capital M sub N is equal to the Hilbert transform of the Borgan map. So we need to show that what we need to show is that the sine of M dot capital M is equal to the sine of M sub N times the sine of capital M sub N. That's what we want to show in the end. And this, the sine function is multiplicative. So this is the sine of MN times capital MN. That's what we need to show to make this identity hold. We need this, of course, for all N up to capital N. We need it for all capital N tuples of integers M such that the Fourier coefficient at M does not vanish. And this is where we're going to use the assumption of rapid increase of these M sub Ns in absolute value. If you write out M dot capital M as M1 capital M1 plus dot 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 M N minus one capital M N minus one plus M sub N capital M sub N. We're comparing the sign of this with the sign of that. And what we want is that the last term in this sum determines the sign. And this will happen when the last term dominates the rest of the sum in absolute value. So we have the thing we want when the absolute value of this part of the sum is less than or equal to the absolute value of the last term. Think for a moment about what that means. You want this last term, the sign of the last term to determine the size of the sum. If the first term is really small, the last term, when you add it to it, it doesn't really, the first term is basically negligible. At least that's a heuristic argument. Uh, you can prove this a bit more rigorously than I said. This is one of those estimates where you just think until it's obvious, then, then you don't have to prove anything. <laughs> So let's assume that M sub N in absolute value is greater than the maximum of this thing here. Where you take this over all M such that the Fourier coefficients of F sub N of M don't vanish. I think I just need this for the one N. If that's not enough, let's just be really cautious and say FK for all K equals one up to N. Say we can do this, that doesn't hurt us at all. And this set of M's here is finite. So this maximum here is also finite. So we can choose M sub N large enough to make that true. Under this assumption, we will have that the thing we need to bound is less than or equal to by the triangle inequality, just chuck all of the absolute values inside. And that will be less than absolute value of MN. And that's less than the absolute value of MN times capital MN, small MN, because M sub N is non-zero and an integer. Because, uh, not that, highlighting the wrong thing, yeah. Because F sub N has mean zero in the nth variable. <laughs> so all of the, the M sub Ns that would break this actually don't contribute. <laughs> So everything works. Everything works assuming that the absolute value of M sub N is large enough, depending on the previous ones, right? Well, and depending on the F, right? You... And depending on the F, but that's okay. That's part of the statement. <clears throat> yeah. The, the statement says that <clears throat> given a sequence of trigonometric polynomials, if the sequence of M's grows fast enough, this is true. 
the rapid increase does depend on the Fs you take. Okay. That's completely okay. It's okay. necessary. It has to be that way, but it works. Okay. So it was, yeah. it's very, very subtle about the order. You first, you start with a this is, the order is important. And then you want this property for the n's function with the MN uh, signal. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of diagonal argument here. Yeah. And the thing is, once you've got your, if your, if your functions F sub N have very large Fourier support, you yes. start needing faster and faster increase of the M's. You go super fast at some yep. point, yeah. But this is an argument that this only applies to trigonometric polynomials and finite sequences of trigonometric polynomials. Right. So you know that your Fourier spectrum is bounded <laughs> uniformly. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's all about the order in which you approximate things. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, here we're not even doing any approximation. This is purely just for the trigonometric polynomials. Oh, in this lemma here, right. But I suppose later... Later on, we're going to do a density argument and say it suffices right. to consider trigonometric polynomials. And right. then you do this argument. And in all of the conclusions, this Borgan map does not appear. The sequence M does not appear. <laughs> okay, right. yeah. These yeah, things yeah. you take without any kind of quantitative yeah. control. It doesn't matter right. at all. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a miracle, right? It's very nice, yeah. Yeah. So we... Yeah, so we have now proven the, the fundamental lemma. We've shown that, yeah, if the sequence M grows fast enough in absolute value, then you have this relation between the signs and then that relation between the signs will give you that these two things are equal up to the sign of M sub N, which is exactly what you want. So now let's do the very last step, proving the fundamental proposition. Do I have time? I've got plenty of time. So just to remind us what we need to show, we need to show this estimate. Uh, G sub n. Well, I was calling them F sub N in the statement, so let's make them Fs. To the capital N. And the assumptions are that F sub N is mean zero in the nth variable valued in the previous N minus one variables. And X is such that the Hilbert transform has bounded LP extension or whatever. You can also just assume this on the Hilbert transform on the torus, that suffices. So the density argument that we were talking about just then, by density, it suffices to assume that each F sub N is a trigonometric polynomial. on the capital N torus. Yeah, not just in each individual variable, but on a whole capital N torus. Basically, it's, it's a double density argument. The trigonometric polynomials are dense in this space and they're dense in Bochner spaces. So you just first approximate the whole function by trigonometric polynomials valued in the target space. And then you approximate the values in the target space by trigonometric polynomials. Basically a double density argument that's painful to write down but obvious when you see it. So we won't do it. We can just assume every F sub N is a trigonometric polynomial. That's not a problem. So now you choose a sequence M sub N, capital M sub N, such that the sine of capital M sub N is Xi N. Xi N is a sequence of signs and such that the sequence of absolute values is sufficiently rapidly increasing with respect to the sequence F sub N so that you can apply Borgan's fundamental lemma. And this is the point Christoph was making here. You've got a sequence of trigonometric polynomials, a finite sequence of trigonometric polynomials, and 
the degree of rapid increase that you need depends on that sequence. It definitely depends on that sequence. But the key thing that we need is that the sign of each of these terms is determined, but that sign does not influence the degree of increase, right? It's really about the absolute values that increase. You can make the signs whatever you want. So there's not a problem at all. So then you take the thing you need, oh, hang on. I've written what we needed to show wrong. We need to put Hilbert transforms in here, <laughs> of course. We're looking at unconditionality of the, the Hilbert transforms applied to these functions in the nth variable. So we take the thing we want to control. And we use the fact that this Borgan map is an isometry. So we can throw that in there for free. We can say that, well, this Xi n is the sign of capital M sub n by construction. And now we have LP in an extra variable because that's what the Borgan map does as an extra variable and it's an isometry. And this Borgan map doesn't depend on N. So we put it inside here and we use this intertwining property. We have a Borgan map applied to a Hilbert transform with the appropriate sine coefficients out the front. So this is equal to the sum of Hilbert transforms valued in LP of the N capital N torus of Borgan maps applied to F sub N. And <clears throat> by this Fabini argument that I said earlier, if you've got boundedness of the torus Hilbert transform with respect to X, then you have it with respect to LP valued in X as well. So this Hilbert transform here is bounded. So you can take it out. It doesn't depend on N. Originally they depended on N. This one does not. And you get, in fact, the Borgan map also doesn't depend on N. So let's just put that out the front of the sum. And you can see where this is going. We've gotten rid of the signs. That was the thing we needed to do. And the Hilbert transforms. And the Borgan map is an isometry, so we can get rid of it. And we are done. How's that? Magic. <laughs> what a proof. If you oh, understand you that in the first go, you're a genius. <laughs> Did you need this Fn to have degree? A certain degree, or did you need the no. Fn to have increasing no. degree? Pardon me? Nothing like that. No. We need the so Fn is a function of the first n variables. So the degree uh, doesn't necessarily increase, but the dependence on right. the variables increases. That's right. Yes, on the variables. Remember, this is right. like a this is coming from a Martingale different sequence ultimately. Yeah. So the yeah. nth term yeah. basically it depends, it's a like a, it's a Radomacher function, the nth one times the something depending on the previous n minus one variables. Right, right. So each of these terms, it depends only on the first n variables mm -hmm. and it's mean zero in the nth variable. This is the important right. property that we, yeah. and we use that strongly throughout the whole argument. You can't yeah. remove any of those assumptions. Mm -hmm. Can you go back to the statement of uh, just what you proved last? Which part? Yeah, this, yeah. Oh, no, oh, to show, I mean, the, the fun, or the fundamental proposition, right? So yeah. let me just uh, write this out properly. Instead oh. of that, so we want. Okay, you still sequence. Of maybe signs, you already did, right? right? You have to. Yep. You have to prove UMD from that. Did you do that already? Or yep, just... that's what we did in the first hour. Yeah, so yeah, let's yeah. just show that again because that was the point. We should go back to like, what does this all have to do with UMD? Mm -hmm. Now that you've seen the proof of the fundamental proposition, let's go back to the derivation of UMD from that because that mm -hmm. was pretty important. That is the whole point here. Yep. Proof that the Hilbert transform boundedness implies UMD, assuming the fundamental proposition. Mm -hmm. And we have the time to go through this again, thankfully. Everything worked out well. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So let's walk through this, not too quickly. We need to show that X has the dyadic UMD property because that's equivalent to the UMD property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we take a dyadic, a Martin Gale with respect to the dyadic filtration. We need to show this unconditionality. Nothing's changed yet. We assume that the, the zeroth term is zero without loss of generality. You can always add that back on. And we represent the different sequence of the Martin girl 
in terms of Rademacher functions. This was something we proved very quickly at the end of the previous hour. Mm -hmm. So we've got some functions phi sub n, functions of sequences of signs, and you just plug in the first n minus one Rademacher functions and multiply it by the nth Rademacher function. Basically, if you, your, your different sequence is the Rademacher sequence with coefficients, and those coefficients only depend on the previous n minus one Rademacher functions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we need to show that. We're up to here. And then we take the Rademacher sequence on the unit interval and replace it by an, an equivalent Rademacher sequence on the n torus, capital N torus, where the, the nth Rademacher variable mm -hmm. lives on the nth component of the capital N torus, the nth variable. And we get to this stage here. And these functions that appear, they are mean zero in the nth variable because Rademacher functions are independent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and have mean zero. And they're LP in the other n minus one variables, as you see there. Mm -hmm. So it suffices to prove this estimate where you don't assume the functions of that form. You just take any functions that are mean zero in the nth variable and depend only on the other n minus one. Mm -hmm. So then using the, the fundamental proposition, you start here, you get to plug in a square of a Hilbert transform because that's minus the identity operator. You can do that in each variable. Everything is mean zero in the nth variable. So the fact that you lose the zero frequency doesn't affect anything. And then you use the fundamental proposition twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Not an easy argument. No, I mean, inventors... technically simpler than Tuesday stuff, but conceptually much more difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. It's, it's important thing is to see it to not get lost. I mean, you blow it up. You have the Hilbert transform on the on the n torus, giving yep. enough flexibility to embed. Basically, you have to embed your. Rademacher expression yeah. somehow into the torus. I mean, yeah. yeah okay. And I think this is actually an argument that Borgan's done in different ways in different problems. If you have the Hilbert transform on the torus, the one dimensional yes. torus, you can amplify that. Yeah. And you can get an operator on the n dimensional torus for every n right. by just having it act on some or all of those variables separately. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and yeah. the bounds for that operator are going to be basically uniform. Yeah. So, what other things would you want to prove with that? So actually with this argument, you can show what we've shown is that boundedness of the Hilbert transform gives you the UMD property. You can actually use this for many different operators and say boundedness of some operator or some family of operators implies the UMD property. Okay. And you basically use the same Borgan map argument, but you have to prove a different intertwining property for each operator. Yeah, yeah. And if your operator's got the right kind of form, you can, this argument will somewhat apply. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been used many times for different things like How's it used? If you take, you can use this for general Reese transforms. You can use this for more general Fourier multipliers that have some homogeneity in some directions. Yeah, yeah. You can use it on anisotropic Fourier multipliers. You can use it on all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately it does boil down to this Borgan map argument. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's very subtle, yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's but yeah. A little bit yeah. flexible, but not too yeah. flexible. Like yeah, you can it's extend it to other settings, but it's really easy. like, it's hard to change this argument. Yeah. I mean, you have one single operator bound that seems very rigid, but then you gain this flexibility. From you can embed a lot in that operator. Yeah. And then there isn't so much structure on the Hilbert transform somehow. You can, uh, I mean, it is what it is, but the Reese transform and what I try to say, the Reese transform is not so surprising anymore once you have yeah. seen this one, right? Exactly. As you said, if you tell me that you can embed the Reese transform into the torus like that, I will believe that yeah. in a second. <laughs> yes, yeah, can be done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I don't think I can say much more about this other than just to summarize what we know at this point, because that's, I said the same thing on Tuesday or last week or something, but it's worth seeing that again. You've got your UMD property. You've got boundedness of the Hilbert transform. You've got your Michelin multiplier theorem. Use both of these ingredients in there. You've got your Littlewood-Paley theorem. Michelin theorem implies that. You've got that these things actually can be used to show boundedness of the Hilbert transform because the Hilbert transform is a Fourier multiplier with a Michelin symbol. 
And now we've got that the Hilbert transform implies U of D. So all of these things are equivalent. So these are the harmonic analysis properties. And you see that the UMD property is necessary and sufficient for all of these harmonic analysis properties. Over here, you've also got probabilistic properties, which we haven't considered in a whole lot of depth. There are more other probabilistic characterizations of the UMD property that I haven't and won't discuss. And we also had this stuff from weeks back about the radon nicotine property that we haven't really talked about for a while. <laughs> And we did show at one point that UMD does imply the radon nicotine property. There's no equivalence here, of course. It's just one direction. Radon nicotine is a bit too weak. But then this had all of these um, measure theoretic properties that were equivalent to the radon nicotine property, but also some geometric properties. Dentity, some of that context sets and dentability dent and yeah. So we had some equivalent stuff there and you can think, okay, well, are there some more geometric properties that are equivalent to UMD? And some things are known there and some things are still open there, but you can do some stuff like that. Yeah. Whole lot of properties that turn out to imply or be implied by other properties. And yeah, big world of properties. And um, finite dimensional spaces have all of them. Hilbert spaces have all of them pretty much. And UMD spaces are, are in a sense the, the next best thing from Hilbert spaces. But actually it turns out some of them are still not nice enough. Like you can still stratify the UMD property a bit more so that you've got some nicer properties, some nicer UMD spaces, some weaker UMD spaces and so on. It's not just Hilbert UMD, there's stuff in between. So next week we'll talk about some stuff that's interesting, Shatton class operators. Just to give a very quick overview of what's that gonna, what that's gonna be about. We've spent the last couple of weeks thinking about Fourier analytic properties of UMD spaces. Like if you have UMD valued functions, can you do Fourier analysis? Natural questions. Turns out, yes, you can for the most part. We're gonna talk about an application of these ideas to a, a problem that looks like it has nothing to do with Fourier analysis, but turns out you can reduce it down to the Mifflin multiplier theorem. So some operator theoretic properties of, of the Shatton classes, which are classes of operators on a Hilbert space. So you've got your bounded operators on a Hilbert space and you've got some subclasses of that, sometimes called SP. And you can prove some, some operator theoretic things using the UMD stuff because it turns out these spaces are all UMD. But we're gonna to have to prove that they're UMD. We're gonna do that by proving that the Hilbert transform is bounded on them. And we know that that implies UMD. <laughs> That's convenient. Okay, here we go. I was going to ask, how do we prove yep. it? Okay, here we go. <laughs> we're gonna prove the UMD using the Kotler identity for the Hilbert transform. This is gonna be fun. Okay. If you, if you find that sort of thing fun. and. Um, then using the fact that they're UMD, we're going to use the full power of the Micklin multiplier theorem, not just the Hilbert transform, and prove some stuff about operator Lipschitz functions, whatever they are. Well, that's 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 really some sort of algebraic thing, applying the Hilbert transform to Shutton class. Yeah, it's a little bit algebraic. Oh, well, yeah, it, it's a Kotler identity. So we're using the algebra properties, we're using some multiplicativity of the Hilbert transform. Like yeah, the product rule for the Hilbert transform. And yeah. the fact that the, the Shatton class S2 or C2 is actually already a Hilbert space. And you can bootstrap that up to get UMD for P between one and infinity. But I'm, okay. I'm spoiling the game now. Now you know how it all works. Uh, okay. <laughs> but at least we have fun right now. <laughs> you got some idea though, like where this all leads to. I mean, all of this is like, it's all well and good to say, suppose your space X is UMD or suppose you have boundedness of the Hilbert transform. It's nice to have some examples that are not obviously UMD but that you can prove right. ah, UMD and then you can you exploit could, that. Yeah. You could have, imagine have this complex analysis help you with the Hilbert transform, in which case, yeah. You can, you can use that if you've got the right kind of spaces. Yeah. In the yeah. case of the Shatton classes though, it's the it's the algebra structure of bounded operators that we end up using. What's Kotler's identity? We want to spoil more. Right? <laughs> yeah, may as well. If you take the Hilbert transform of a product of two functions. Yes. Um, then what is that? It's like, you've got a product rule type thing this looks like the Leibniz rule, but then I think you get minus hf.hg yeah. 
or plus, something like that. I forget what the sign is here. Yeah, but it's obvious once you write down, once you interpret the Hilbert transform as sort of turning real to imaginary part of yeah, you can prove it from that. function. This one becomes very, yeah, well obvious. Yeah, yeah. Once you've got the Fourier multiplier characterization as well, you can see it from that. There's a couple of ways to see it. But that's that's very yeah. That's very algebraic. Very yeah. You do that. You really make use of that, yeah. Then I can see how this whole board game, you know, yeah. helps. Uh, yeah. yeah. And the, the idea here is like if you know how Hilbert transform of a product behaves, you can reduce down from LP spaces to LP on two oh. spaces, and you do the same thing. Oh. With the, the Schatten class, you go from CP down to CP right. on two. That's the classical proof of yeah. the boundedness of the Hilbert transform in LP one. with yep. even integers, right? Uh, two to the n powers of two. Two to just two to the n. I think you can do yeah. even integers. Ah, Wait. Okay. okay, I'll have to think. I have to remember. I did this actually. In the... All right. We're, we're going to do powers of two and then interpolate, although we don't know the interpolation theorem. I did the bad thing. I did four in the class and said everything else is an exercise. So therefore, I don't remember whether it was the even integers. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it's powers of two. You have to go from p to 2p. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then interpolate, use duality, all those things. Anyway, we'll do all this next week. I mean, I'm not really explaining how these things work. Yeah, okay. Let's not spoil everything. Yeah. everything from that next week, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm. But this is so, very yeah. Are there other questions, whether from Christoph or anybody else? No. Okay. Then Thank office you. hours tomorrow as usual. Exam questions. I hope every. Does anybody need the exam information and not have it? Um, oh, the exam questions on my website now, so it doesn't matter. If you need to find them, you can find them there. Um, does, is anybody signed up for an exam but hasn't gotten their time? Seems okay. Then I guess everybody got my email, at least everybody that's here. Cool. Don't forget, if you have questions about the exam questions, you can ask them in the office hours. Like, I'm not going to tell you the answers to the questions, but I can at least confirm or deny your intuition and lead you down the right track. There are no excuses for failing this course. <laughs> okay.